While Hell's Kitchen is oftentimes entertaining, because admit it, that's why we're all here in the first place, there are also those times when things got really emotional. I was really torn up when I heard about how Tom passed away on July 1st of this year. Now, before I get into that, let's start by sending my thoughts and sympathy to all of Tom's family, friends, and loved ones. There's no denying that Tom truly made season two memorable. Not least of which, how strong-willed he was during the signature dish challenge, where he was the sixth in line for Ramsay to judge his dish. As Ramsay lifted the cloche that was covering it, you could tell that he was a bit nervous. Tom even admitted that he was sweating, and even got a little bit of self-deprecating humor in. I sweat. I sweat all the time. I'm a schwetzer. Don't worry about that. The dude really knew how to make light of any moment. He had prepared shrimp scampi with a little twist, and I'm sure nobody expected it to be a cooked Caesar salad. Obviously, Chef Ramsay was appalled by the concept. First time in my entire life, I've been served a cooked Caesar salad. But this is the moment where Tom really impressed everyone. Despite Chef Ramsay's strong reaction, unlike the other contestants who are never receptive to criticism, Tom neither talked back nor got defensive. I'm a man, I can take it. If he didn't care, he wouldn't break my chops. He simply said that he could handle the criticism and he wasn't going to give Chef Ramsay a hard time about it. And that is exactly what Chef Ramsay expects from his chefs. With that statement right there, Tom showed the world that he had thick skin and was ready to learn from the experience. However, I didn't like the way he was treated in the third episode. During the relay challenge, Tom took the initiative to be the first on his team, and he was responsible for receiving information about the three dishes they needed to prepare, being chicken, tortellini, and salmon. Somehow, Tom found pre-made tortellini, but when Chef Ramsay noticed, he called him out and reminded him that there were ingredients available to make fresh ones. Tom not only acknowledged this, but also effectively communicated all the necessary information to Giacomo, ensuring that the team made some progress. At the end of the challenge, Tom felt really confident because his team had successfully completed two out of the three dishes. However, when Ramsay started giving critiques, things took a turn for the worse. Chef Ramsay, in a shocking and completely inappropriate move, resorted to fat shaming Tom. Do I slouch and slob and talk like this, like some big fat fucking slob? But I really didn't find that funny at all. And what's more, Tom's reaction was justified. He attempted to interject because he wanted to voice his thoughts, but Chef Ramsay's derogatory comment took it to a whole different level. But Tom wasn't willing to back down this time. Yeah, he decided to push back and defend himself, rightfully so. Who do you think you're talking to? He doesn't want to get a street fight with me, trust me. Sometimes we end up forgetting that these are thinking, feeling human beings, not actors. By the way, yeah, I know, they're also human too, but I figured I'd make the distinction here. And also, there's a shit ton of editing that goes into making someone appear the way they do on the show. Turns out, contestants are poked and prodded to give certain reactions in their confessionals. But Chef Ramsay is in a cult with Chef Ramsay being the all-knowing infallible leader or something. So maybe sometimes I can stop treating him like one and agree that there have been times where he's definitely crossed the line. I came across this post where Grub Street called Chef Ramsay off-putting. And this may still be the nicest thing they said about him. Listen to this. The kind of negative press the chef seems to actively seek, it gives him fuel to continue to build his empire of television shows, cookbooks, and overpriced restaurants. Grub Street doesn't begrudge Ramsay for being successful, but his success comes at the expense of manners and taste. Among the laundry list of allegations against him, the article also called him out for fat-shaming Hell's Kitchen contestants. In my humble opinion, Chef Ramsay seems to have grown and mellowed out as he's grown older and become a dad. But yeah, there's no denying that in the past, he could be pretty tough on people when it came to their looks, height, and weight. Missy, Missy, come here you fat mouth little stupid bitch. Now, let's be honest, these criticisms have nothing to do with their actual skill in the kitchen. Coming back to Tom, his obituary reads, Thomas Henry Pauly, age 60, passed away on Saturday, July 1st, 2023, at his home in Lakewood. Born in Englewood, New Jersey, Thomas was raised in Harrington Park and has resided in Lakewood for the last two years. Also, did you know that Tom worked on Wall Street for many years before following his true passion for cooking? Yeah, turns out he attended the French Culinary Institute in New York in 2004 to 2006 before venturing out to different restaurants. What's more, apart from being a great chef, Tom was an avid golfer and a huge New York Yankees and New York Giants fan. Rest easy, man. Up next, when asked about his future plans, this next contestant said, I've never been one of those kinds who has an ultimate goal. I kind of just go with the flow. Some people have the desire to get to one point. My path chose me, so in that respect, you never know what's coming down the pike. 
I might find something else later on in life. Any knowledge is good knowledge, so I'll take it all. I mean, the man I was at 25 isn't the man I was at 30. You know what's coming, as far as I know now, I'm loving it. Well, these were the words of the late great season 16 contestant, Polly Giganti. On April 20th, 2017, Polly was found dead in his home in Philadelphia, as reported by Philly.com. He was only 36 years old. According to James Garrow, a spokesperson for the Philadelphia Department of Public Health, Polly's passing was the result of accidental drug intoxication. Sadly, the restaurant industry has become extraordinarily fertile ground for the abuse of illicit substances like alcohol, prescription opioids, cocaine, and marijuana. But the most pernicious of them all, according to the experts, is fentanyl. It's said that people who come from unstable family backgrounds, have experienced inconsistent parenting, or grew up in a less than functional home can still climb the ladder and earn a decent living. However, it's really common that they often carry their past experiences with them. Addiction is less about your external environment and more about what's happening inside your mind and body. And the restaurant industry can fuel these issues due to the ready availability of substances, demanding hours, culture of abuse, low wages, and high expectations. Polly grew up poor and only worked in restaurants to survive. And guess what? He never even wanted to become a chef. I never went to school for cooking. I was gonna be an engineer. I was basically doing it as a measuring stick on myself. I didn't care about any preconceived fears and notions. I just wanted to see how I could cook against other trained chefs. And boy, he was pretty impressive. Man, he not only taught himself the art of cooking, but managed to reach the impressive fourth place in the competition. That was just behind Heidi Parent, the runner-up Heather Williams, and the winner Kimberly Ann Ryan. His journey on the show kicked off with a remarkable start, and he made quite the impression on Chef Ramsay. During the signature dish challenge, Polly showcases culinary talent by presenting biscotti crusted scallops over crispy polenta with a basil curry cream sauce. It's a five, congratulations. I am ecstatic, thank the lord. His dish earned him the distinction of being the first male contestant to ever achieve a perfect score of five in the new format of this challenge, and that's no small feat. At the time of his passing, Polly was running the restaurant Bira in Philly and his journey on the show is a testament to the power of determination and self-learning. You will be missed, Polly. But what happened to this next contestant from season 12 who was dealing with cirrhosis, a liver condition, and also a chronic inflammatory bowel disease is a real shame. I'm of course talking about contestant Jessica Vogel, who suffered from some major health concerns and, to make things worse, also fell prey to substance abuse. Although she was believed to be in rehab, it came too little, too late. Her fiancé, John Kayser, shared the heartbreaking news of her passing on July 30th, 2018. The poor woman was only 34. Despite her ongoing treatment for colitis, her heart ultimately just stopped beating, as Kayser explained. Dan Ryan, a fellow contestant from season 11, said, I have no words. I'll miss her greatly. All HK contestants are family to us, alumni. After the news of her death broke out, more comments started pouring in from the Hell's Kitchen family. Rest in peace to a friend and sister through the birth of fire, tweeted season 12 contestant Gabriel. Though Jessica was being treated for colitis at the time of her death, the chef seemed to acknowledge that she had a drinking problem, as pointed out in a media.com post from October 2017. It has since been deleted though. She wrote, When my sister says start a blog, the narcissistic alcoholic in me thinks me and I. I'm fucked up. Truly, sure, I was on Hell's Kitchen with Jeff Ramsey and Cutthroat Kitchen on Food Network. I went to culinary school in Denver, grew up at the Jersey Shore, was raised by Mormon nannies in a mansion, dated a coastie, and had a stint of living near strippers in St. Pete, Florida. I'm weeks away from being 34 years old and got told I drink too much and have cirrhosis. Did it stop me from pouring shots of alcohol? No. Did my lifestyle of sex, drugs, and foie gras come to a born-again Christian revelation? Fuck that noise. I don't know if you want to have an adventure tale, but I'm here and ready to tell. My name is Jess, and I've lived to tell about it. To be continued. Those last three words are genuinely bone-chilling. It really shows you how fragile our lives are. Rest easy, Jessica. You were gone way too soon. Now, I want to take a quick break from this pretty heavy topic for a sec to make this known. If you or anyone you know is struggling with addiction or mental health issues, know that help is actually available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. 
feel free to share this video with a friend and tell them that you love them and appreciate them today. Speaking of seeking help, I think Gennaro Delilo had a tough run in Hell's Kitchen. It started with his duck breast dish during the signature dish challenge, which didn't impress Ramsay to say the very least. Gennaro, that completely ducked up this dish. Things didn't improve much for Gennaro as the competition continued though. During a service challenge, he and Matt Hearn made errors with the sea bass, one was overcooked and the other was undercooked. While Gennaro was considered for elimination by his team during their deliberation, he managed to avoid being nominated and stayed a bit longer. In the second episode of season 16, the men's team faced a rough service that led Chef Ramsay to kick them out of the kitchen and let the women take over. Bruce, get out! Get out! It was the second time in a row that the men had to be shown the door, and this time, Gennaro had his share of responsibility for sending up raw New York strip steaks not once, but twice. Look, it's raw, it's white. I'm, I'm talking to you. Yes, would you like another chef? What, what the f do you think? Ultimately, Gennaro found himself on the chopping block, nominated for elimination alongside Aaron Smock. Chef Ramsay selected Gennaro due to his struggles in the kitchen and a perceived lack of passion. Despite the challenges and setbacks, Gennaro held on to his belief in himself, stating, I have a lot of passion and fight in me, say that my teammates didn't see that. I know I'm a good cook. My fiance knows I'm a great chef. I'm a winner in my eyes. And I agree. Nobody else, certainly not a reality TV competition, should decide your worth but you. And certainly not Johnny. You're embarrassing me in front of one of my heroes. Well, I apologize for that. No, but for real, how overplayed was his reaction? So damn forced. And it came after Gennaro very rationally said, Like, I'm not happy with what happened. Yeah, I up, man, but I'm not gonna let you guys put me down about it. He admitted his mistakes, didn't he? So what was he supposed to do? Throw punches in the air or scream and shout like the rest of them? You have to agree, Gennaro handled every situation with so much grace and poise. Rest in peace, brother. Moving on, when season 12 contestant Sandra Flores opened up about her post-HK journey, nothing prepared us for the devastating tragedy that followed. Listen to this. She wrote, In 2014, I dominated the airwaves of season 12 on Hell's Kitchen with chef Gordon Ramsay, right up until the finale. Upon my return home from wrapping up filming the show two months later, I wasn't feeling right. I was not myself. I was running about six miles a day and in the top condition of my life, but had severe fatigue. I felt as if all my energy was being sucked away to some unknown place and just wouldn't stop. Upon my insistence to doctors that something was wrong with me, my life came to a screeching halt. I got diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer. I felt like my life was over and I could die. She continued, two months later, I had a double mastectomy. The 9 centimeter tumor that plagued me and 30 of my lymph nodes was removed. I've suffered chemotherapy from hell. My good doctors at Memorial Sloan Kettering have brought me to the edge of death trying to kill my cancer with treatment to the point where I lack the strength to walk. I've endured 25 rounds of radiation and lost another one of my trademarks besides my double Ds. I also lost my pride and joy, my long golden hair, but not my will to live. Luckily, I got to donate it where two wigs could be made for little girls who have lost all their hair to cancer treatment. She concluded by saying, I still dream of having my own show and opening up restaurants all over every major city where I can create art with my love for food and abuse my staff as I see fit. This is my story and I will continue to be the author of it. Pretty inspiring stuff, huh? But sadly, this is where the story doesn't end well. On January 22nd, 2022, she passed away. Man, that's really tough to say, but you'll always be remembered, Sandra. But this next contestant did something shocking. Season 2's contestant Rachel Brown reportedly took her own life after appearing on Hell's Kitchen. She was only 41. Her death made headlines and brought about the question of whether or not the reality show and Chef Ramsay's treatment of the contestants were to blame. The accusations were getting really heated because she wasn't the only Gordon Ramsay reality show contestant to come to the same end. Remember the restaurant which was featured on Kitchen Nightmares Campania's owner, Joseph Cerniglia? Your business is about to swim down the Hudson. If you're out of the loop, you need to watch this video I made about it. Anyway, writer and editor Cynthia Dermondi wrote in her blog, To me, this is a story about people who are so desperately searching for a handle on their lives, so they throw all of their hopes into a television show to fix it. If this isn't a part of what's so wrong about today's culture, I don't know what is. Gordon Ramsay had no comment on these deaths, but why would he? There's simply a sad coincidence that points to troubles way beyond the scope of any harsh words he could launch at them and nothing more. Damn, that's really harsh. But I guess she does have a point. What are your thoughts? 
The former president of the American Academy of Suicidology, Dr. Robert Ufit, shares some insights saying that she might have had a very bevy problem before appearing on the show. He continued, I would almost bet that the show itself should not be held responsible. I would say that the show might have tripped off something else that was going on in their lives. It is quite the possibility. Not just psychologically, the show may also complicate existing medical problems like Aaron Song and his diabetic conditions. Nevertheless, they are loved and will deeply be missed. And hey, I'm sure they're cooking up a storm in heaven's kitchen, right? So which of these contestants live on in your hearts even after all these years? Let me know in the comment section down below. I want to make sure that everyone I've talked about and more are remembered. <laughs> I can't believe I'm cracking, I'm cracking up right now. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron Song ranked in 10th place in the third season of Hell's Kitchen. Song, the Asian cowboy, was one of the nicest people to be featured on the show. Unfortunately though, being nice is not enough. After all, the competition is tough and Chef Ramsay is tougher. Song frequently got emotional because the competition was stressing him out. <laughs> now you're making me feel nervous. I am not going into service with this level of incompetence, you know that. The job can certainly be stressful, but things can feel even worse when your team fails because of you. Take a look at what happened before the first dinner service. Song was pretty much in a state of panic throughout every service. He really wanted to give it his best, but his health started to give up. I'm really stressed right now. I'm pretty scared of everything, actually. While Song eventually wanted to quit, his teammates motivated him to stay. Quits isn't tonight or quits isn't? No, quits, this is it. As in for good? Go. Yeah. I don't think I can continue. Yes, no, yes, you are. are. Yeah, you leaving us high and dry? I'm not leaving right, you high exactly. and dry. Exactly. He's staying. I like that. I like no, that. You no, staying. No. Here's what he told Chef Ramsay about his desire to quit. You gonna white. Chef, I don't want to quit because of me. I don't want to quit because of the guys that they're going to try Breathe. so hard. Shh. Everything's trying to be hard. Hey, hey. Relax. Yeah. Relax. Relax. And here's how his team tried to pull him together. However, all that pep talking wasn't enough. In the third episode, something unexpected happens. Song slumped down onto the floor and collapsed. He's a medic! He's a medic! He's a medic. He's a Guys, give him room. Aaron just kind of fainted. As Chef Ramsay broke the news to the other contestants, he was immediately rushed to the hospital. For obvious reasons, Song was asked to withdraw from the competition. Bit of bad news, yes? Unfortunately, having just spoken to Aaron, he's sick, but he will not be returning to Hell's Kitchen. Post Hell's Kitchen, Song became a celebrity chef, but unfortunately, that fame was very short-lived. Three years after his appearance on the show, Song passed away in Rancho Palos Verdes, California, due to complications from diabetes. Next up is Luis Petroza. One medium well, one normal. I asked for two beef. Okay. One hell of a one. King John Dory! That's one, so you need one more. I want them together! Luis Petroza debuted in season 4, where he ended things off as a runner up. Petroza, throughout the entire season, showed excellent leadership and collaborative skills. He was passionate about cooking, had a fantastic level of maturity, and did a great job motivating others. Despite these qualities, Petroza didn't have that much of an impressive start. His signature dish was a disaster, but he made up for it during the dinner service. Shit. These are potatoes? Yes, sir. And how much grease and fat and oil did you fry in? However, there were times when he made mistakes and was at the receiving end of Chef Ramsay's wrath. Here are some of his biggest blunders. One medium well, one normal. I asked for two beef. Okay. One hell of a one f***ing John Dory. That's one, so you need one more. I want them together. Seared uh, tuna. The, um, the, um, the, um. Stop. Yes. Stop. Yes. Do me a favor, get out. The most incredible quality that Petroza had was that he was able to own up to his mistakes. He consistently redeemed himself by improving on his weaknesses. Chef Ramsay too saw great potential in him. He was also very humble, naming himself the weakest contestant among his peers. That's when Chef Ramsay told him this. Petroza. Yes, yeah, Chef. You're a gentleman. Thanks, Chef. It means a lot coming from you. Because of his genuine attitude and honest behavior, Petroza became one of the sweetest competitors in the show's history. That doesn't take away from the fact that he was messy and disorganized. Despite this, Petroza managed to climb the ladder of success and became the first person to reach the finals. First person that will be heading into the final of Hell's Kitchen is Petroza. Congratulations. Thank you, Chef. Really well done. Thank you, Chef. Even though Petroza didn't win the show, he won everyone's hearts. 
After Hell's Kitchen, Petroza returned to cooking and became an executive chef. Tragically though, on November 15th of 2019, the admirable chef passed due to complications of lung cancer. On to the next one being Jonathan Plumley. Apple. You can f off now. Serious? I'll pay for the tickets. Jonathan Plumley debuted in season 9, ranking in 10th place. His first impression as a chef to Ramsay wasn't very fantastic. Even though he wasn't very skillful, he was quite the comedian. First, he used canned pineapple despite knowing how much Chef Ramsay despised canned and frozen food. Secondly, he hilariously blamed the time constraints on his use of them. And third, his dish was so messy that Chef Ramsay didn't even attempt to taste it. Look at how this all unfolded. You open a can of pineapple and you stick it on top of a chicken. Limited time today. Limited time. 45 minutes. Limited time. Yes. But the surprise in fact was you opened it out of a can. That's what pissed me off more than anything. Throughout the competition, Plumley didn't make any improvements. Chef Ramsay often schooled him for this. Check this out. I need another Caesar with a little less dress. Hey, come here. I'm pissed off. Throw it in the trash. So Miss Evans said her Caesar salad was right. So I need Who another said the Caesar salad. Jonathan, yes, why is Paul taking over the garnish? Uh, he's helping me out, Chef. Helping out doing of, it. I'm having a little bit of trouble. Oh, come on. Although Plumley was never nominated until the sixth episode, when Chef Ramsay finally showed him his wrath, he sang deeper but promised to do better. He not only screwed up the service but also lied communication. Finally, by the eighth service, his fate in the competition was sealed. Here's what one of his teammates had to say. There was no communication between Natalie and Jonathan tonight. They literally had their backs turned to each other all night. Plumley was eliminated for his foolish mistakes, poor performance, and for trying to brush his teammates aside. Post Hell's Kitchen, he became a culinary consultant. On February 2nd of 2018, he was arrested for disorderly conduct and resisting arrest. Sadly, on February 9th of 2022, Plumley met his end. The cause of his death was not disclosed and remains unknown. We're now moving on to Keith Green. Spoiled brat syndrome, that huffy puffy, turn their eyes, fold their arms, and not even look at me in the eyes. Keith Green was featured in the second season, ranking in third place. Green's performance was impressive, especially since he improved as time went on. However, his attitude totally sucked. He was unsympathetic and very rude. Just watch him stroll around. Hey, big boy, you have got to smarten your act up. Do you understand? Yes, Let's sir. go, yes? Hello? Let's pull your pants up a little bit, yes? You got it, chef. Yeah? Huh? There were times when he shined in the kitchen, and other moments when his rotten attitude overshadowed everything. Larry says he has been sick, but um, he just doesn't know how to cut it. You gotta make more bags. He led the blue team to victory with his exceptional communication and leadership skills, but his behavior pissed everyone off. Even Chef Ramsay warned him about this down the line. One of Green's best performances was during the sixth dinner service. Where's the risotto? Come on, put it down so I can take. Where's the tomato? Yeah. Nice. Okay. Results are lovely. Keith. Yes, chef. Good man. During the service, he was doing exceptionally well and gave his team a good head start. Chef Ramsay also complimented Green for the same reason. His performance during the first Black Jacket dinner service was fantastic, and Chef Ramsay even praised him for it. However, Green's behavior was the worst during the last dinner service. His rude, overconfident, and sour attitude was back again. When Green was eliminated for his lousy attitude, he started arguing with Chef Ramsay instead of walking out like a true chef. A furious Chef Ramsay shut him down though. Post Hell's Kitchen, he went on to work with Heather West and later became an executive chef. Sadly, on August 15th of 2012, Green was found dead after going for a swim in the morning. How tragic. Hell's Kitchen isn't just about the drama, or Chef Ramsay shouting his way through service. It's a launch pad for some seriously talented chefs to get some momentum going in their careers. Just like this contestant, who earned himself the badass moniker, the One-Armed Bandit. Dave Levy rocks season 6 with his skills and charm, scoring himself a sweet $250,000 and a gig at a Roxy restaurant and bar in Whistler, British Columbia. But it wasn't all smooth sailing for Dave to get to that point. In the very first episode, Chef Ramsay, for the first time, declared that the signature dish challenge was now a team thing. Yeah, so any and all studying of previous seasons that this guy did was pretty much pointless now. Either way, Dave was the first contestant up from the blue team, facing off against Suzanne, and this is what he presented. Ostrich with pan seared Brussels sprouts. Dave was really looking forward to Chef Ramsay's feedback. I've definitely idolized Chef Ramsay for years. But he also said that any negative criticism from his mentor would leave him mentally damaged. So the guy was certainly playing with fire. 
Thankfully for him, the tasting started off on a good note. Chef Ramsay thought that the ostrich dish was delicious, especially the seasoning, but he wasn't too thrilled about the Brussels sprouts. Why are these f***ing Brussels sprouts undercooked? Well, a mixed bag is better than an outright failure, I guess. Yeah, shit, Brussels sprouts. Ah! However, seeing Ramsay spitting out his dish like that did more damage to his self-esteem than he expected. Luckily for Dave, Suzanne's risotto wasn't all that great either. The two of them ended up scoring no points for their team, and Dave headed back to the line feeling disappointed in himself. It's like heartbreaking that he didn't like that. You know what they say, first impressions last a lifetime. But this really isn't how Dave wanted to be remembered. Thankfully, the rest of the blue team managed to secure a win. And, well, Dave found himself at the receiving end of a reward that he didn't play a huge part in earning. Enjoy it. It's a okay. treat to be sitting here with your chef and not being screamed at. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> the famous chef then took the opportunity to explain that the only reason he's so tough on chefs is because he wants them to improve. However, the infamous Joseph had to cut in with a rather rude remark. All this, you know, that's not what I'm here for. I'm not gonna lose my eye on the prize. And Dave didn't waste a second to defend Chef Ramsay. He's being a little too intense in the way he disrespects Chef Ramsay. Dave was pro Ramsay right from the start, and he was determined to win the man's confidence. But unfortunately, they decided to add more trouble in his way. In episode 3, after losing the firefighter past the meal challenge, the blue team was punished with cleaning the fire trucks, followed by scrubbing the dining room clean. While the red team took off in the choppers to claim the reward, Dave found himself stuck between the trucks, like literally. I felt my wrist start to swell up right away. Dave decided to keep his mouth shut and soldier on because he didn't want to alarm anyone, but the damage was already done. As the blue team proceeded with the second half of the punishment, Dave found himself scrambling for ice to ease the swelling around his wrists. My wrist is really screwed up. It was really swollen that I can't feel the tips of my fingers. After a quick check from the medic, Dave was immediately rushed to the hospital. This wasn't something a nice pack could set right. It was far, far worse. When Dave returned, he came back with some bad news. I have a torn FCR and a slight fracture of the wrist. Amidst the growing concerns of his teammates, Dave made it clear that he was tough enough to bear the pain. I'm a tough guy. I can take the pain. Dude, I'm fine to work. The following day, when Chef Ramsay checked in on him, Dave brushed it off like it was no big deal. And then, when the famous chef dropped a bomb about needing waiters for the service, Dave decided to volunteer. Although Ramsay wasn't too sure how he'd manage, he did loud him for his courage by dropping the nickname that Dave would soon become known by a one arm bandit. That's you know, I'm not a problem. I can use both hands, chef. Huh? But with time, the pain only got worse. And the blue team truly started to worry that Dave's injury would only weigh them down. We got Dave and his wrist, and we have Kevin and his ankles. However, he wasn't about to give up. Fairly unbearable pain. Even if I'm doing harm to my wrist, I just push through it. Despite the excruciating pain radiating throughout his hand, he went ahead with all the chores by himself. I mean, just look at the man working his hands on the dough. Unbelievable. Shape it, knead it. I'm waiting to hear from the doctor what the deal is. Dave wasn't just determined, he was dead set on proving his worth to the famous chef. However, the injury was a thorn in his side time and time again, and it wasn't finished with him yet. For a period of two weeks, you will not be able to move your thumb. Two weeks felt like a lifetime for Dave. He wasn't ready to leave the competition so early, but was heartbroken enough that he needed some time alone. <sighs> Had it been for any other contestant, they'd have left at the first sign of trouble. But Dave, despite feeling crushed, headed straight to Chef Ramsay's office to break the news to him. Unsure of what to expect next, Dave was so nervous about how Chef Ramsay would react. But you won't believe what happened. Chef Ramsay didn't want to lose a talented chef like Dave over an injury. Considering it was Dave's weaker hand which was affected, Chef Ramsay decided to give him the opportunity to stick around. Are you going to stay in Hell's Kitchen? There are so many thoughts going through my head right now, I don't, I don't know what to think. And he took it. Chef Ramsay was more than happy to give him the thumbs up. Uh, too soon. The go ahead on that call. And it was for sure the right decision. Because the next thing you know, Dave was back during the dinner service, rocking a cast, and Chef Ramsay had him working the dessert station. Dave, I want you on desserts, please. For that cast, fresh, I want it over there, yes? Let's go. And boy, oh boy, did he hustle. The one-armed bandit whipped up desserts like a champ, catching Chef Ramsay's eye in the process. He's got one fucking hand in action, yeah, and he's working quicker than anyone. Coming from Ramsay, that's a compliment that can't go unnoticed. Dave's determination was off the charts, and what do you know? 
The blue team ended up sweeping the win, and I think you know who they had to thank for it. Holy crap! Dave had just proven to Chef Ramsay and the rest of his team that he could win services with an arm literally tied behind his back. However, towards the end of the day, Dave's pain came back to bite him. Back at the dorms, he struggled with simple tasks like trying to open a chicken pot pie wrapper. And when Amanda offered to lend him a hand, he refused help. Oh, I have to be able to like do things myself. <laughs> of course, he ended up dropping the package. But he continued to shine throughout the services that followed. For instance, during the welcome home dinner service, Dave held down the garnish station like a pro. What's more, when the red team couldn't handle the heat, he dashed out to help serve up another round of entrees to the dining room. We went over, put a bow on it, and that's it. And his confident stride continued to reign supreme. During the 700 calories three-course meal challenge, Dave teamed up with Andy to tackle the dessert. But when Dave suggested adding some sugar to their filling, that little suggestion got shot down in record time. I have to add sugar to it. I don't think so. I think it's perfect. And when it came time to present their dish, a fancy egg white crepe with fruit compote and blackberry yogurt cream, things took a pretty bad turn. And... <laughs> oh, come on. Ramsey couldn't help but chuckle at its simplicity. I mean, what even was this? It tastes foul. That's the kind of crap you serve when you've just come out of a heart bypass or an ulcer operation. That's a joke. So maybe Andy and Dave didn't end up being the best pair after all. And maybe he really did do good by himself, listening to his gut and flying solo. However, during the dinner service, Dave was assigned to the garnish station. But sous chef Scott caught him cooking up the wrong garnishes. Dave owned up to his mistake, admitting that he was just spacing out. Sometime later, he had a bit of an issue with Kevin over garnish timing. You don't even know what you're doing because you're cooking something we don't even fucking need. And he was far from through. I got three minutes, everybody else? I have three minutes, so you have four. When Kevin yells at me, I could give a Mashed potatoes ready? Three minutes. I still have right, one minute left. That was about, yeah, one no, minute, one minute. minute. For a while, it looked like Dave was just having trouble getting along with people. And in a team competition of all things, well, then losing the challenge was inevitable. But like I mentioned earlier, Dave was a one-man team. And this attribute of his took center stage during a future dinner service when the chef's table showed up. To see Dave's welcoming and hospitable approach was quite surprising. I want to make sure you guys get taken care of. We're going to work it out for you. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Luckily, his risottos were spot on, and the chef's table were in love with everything they tasted. Here's two samples of the risotto for you to try right now. Not bad, huh? It felt great to get compliments from such highly esteemed chefs. Very nice risotto. Thank you, chef. Despite the blue team ultimately losing the service, Dave earned some props as the best of the worst for kicking things off strong with those appetizers. He was in front of the red kitchen with appetizers. Clearly the best of the worst. The dude clearly had the chops, but the complaints still kept coming. I need four portions of mash, yeah? Give me your pen. Right Give me your right here, right here. Look at the speed of Dave and just watch Andy. And coming. One of the best performances came from Dave. You proved to me tonight that you're no fluke. Don't stop. No, sure. But hey, of course it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. A real success story has a couple of rough patches at least, and Dave's was no exception. Like during the crepe challenge, when he faced off against Sabrina in the dessert round. He whipped up a cream cheese and mixed berry crepe, but man, it was hardly the prettiest dish that night. Why is it full of gunk around the outside? It looks like a plate of diarrhea. Chef Ramsay and Jean-Philippe were straight up shocked at how bad it looked. So shocked that Dave lost the round and eventually the entire challenge itself, which left them stuck prepping both kitchens for the next service and chowing down on some choice cuts. Think boiled cow tongue, stale baguette, and head cheese. I don't know what to say, guys. I'm sorry. We had a horrible loss this morning, especially me. I'll be working very hard, nonstop. I have to prove myself or I know I'm history. But hey, throughout the punishment, Dave stood out. He owned up to his mistake and apologized to his team like a true gentleman. But the smell of that cow tongue almost had him losing his lunch. I tried to sample the cow tongue. Just the smell of it alone almost made me barf all over the plate. And who could blame him? Dave wasn't just a talented chef with a lovable personality, he was also a team player down the line. During prep, he showed genuine concern for Andy's well-being after an incident. Andy, like the tips of his fingers were literally taken off. And during the dinner service, he went above and beyond to support his teammates once again. I don't know how Andy's going to be able to work. I'll work risottos. I'll do all your risotto. Dave stepped up, handling both their stations without missing a beat. 
juggling two servings of risotto plus tagliatelle, lamb, and steak all by himself with a broken arm was no easy feat. And of course, Chef Ramsay loved the food. Risotto is fucking delicious. Very nice. Service, please. Yup, every dish he served was spot on. Don't take this the wrong way. We are 10,000 times better cooked with one hand. At this point, it really got me thinking, why not just give him the award instead of waiting another half a season to get to it? I mean, this dude truly deserved it. But whenever he got on a roll, his hand came back to haunt him. In episode 10, Dave was holding it down on the appetizer station when disaster struck. He lifted a heavy pan and ended up aggravating his already injured wrist. I just felt a nerve in my wrist shot up to my elbow, that shot up to my ear. My whole body like twists like this. And all of Dave's fears were back in full force. I gotta see the medic. Oh. Oh. Despite the shooting pain radiating from his wrist, Dave refused to throw in the towel. You can move him a little bit though. Horrific pain signals down here. Yeah, the guy was nothing if not resilient. Dave powered through the pain and got right back to work, earning some serious props from Kevin, especially when his bisque was actually accepted. I can muscle through the pain, and I'm not giving up. Dave, I need a bisque. Yeah, I got a bisque working, chef. Dave, you're the fucking man. You are awesome. Now that is what I call dedication. While most folks are usually busy competing and looking out for themselves, this man really got his team behind him. When they got their black jackets, he wasn't too thrilled to be paired up with Suzanne for the Taste It Now Make It Challenge. <laughs> Suzanne is definitely not my choice, but whatever, I'll just roll with it. I mean, he'd seen her game from the very beginning, so it's only fair that he went into it with an opinion already formed. Let's see how things went, huh? So we've got sautéed turbo yep. on a bed of blanched spinach, parsnip, parsnip puree, puree. Mm -hmm. bits of calamari, tarragon, chervil, and passion, passion fruit. fruit sauce. Okay, good. I feel really good about it. It was a beautiful partnership. But hey, they ended up winning the challenge, nailing every component of Chef Ramsay's dish, except for the puree. Puree was a white onion. Oh, it was sweet. Everybody missed the puree. Like, we're all on an equal level. Still, a win's a win, and they scored a lunch at Chef Ramsay's London West Hollywood, tagging along with season four winner Christina. And Dave played no small part in their joint victory. Now that we are in the black jacket, right. now it's time to like turn that off. Well, don't yes. turn it off. I want to hear it that from you her. But lunch didn't exactly go so smoothly. Dave found it really hard to get a word in edgewise with Christina. Thanks for having me. Lovely to meet you both. All in all, it was great, except from Suzanne. Yeah, not exactly a ladies' man, I guess. Anyway, sometime later in the season, the tension between Dave and Tennille boiled over. He wasn't too pleased with her after she flip-flopped on a deliberation decision and ultimately sent Van packing because of it. Suzanne, are you? I think that's decided. Tennille decided to flip a switch down there. And it's safe to say that things escalated very quickly from there. Why didn't we just agree to Van beforehand? We didn't all agree. I don't trust Tennille for shit. She's got no place in Hell's Kitchen anymore. I hope she's out of here real soon. Man, seeing this side of the guy for the first time was a huge surprise. Who knew he could blow up like that? But the drama didn't stop there. Dave ended up storming out of the room, leaving the situation unresolved. Fuck you. Eventually, Dave ended up on the losing side of a challenge, and as a punishment, he had to clean up a stretch of road outside and the front entrance of Hell's Kitchen too. To make matters worse, he was stuck with Tennille of all people. I have to be near Tennille today, it makes me nauseous. If I hear Tennille bitching, I'll lose my mind. Her constant complaints didn't help his mood either, and while they were sweeping up the front, Dave's fractured wrist started to act up again. Perfect timing, right? It wants to crack the plaster in half, it's so swollen. I don't know what to do. Although he tried to ice it, the agony just wouldn't let up. Back at the dorms, he was in real bad shape. Ugh. Something just pulled. Kevin urged him to prioritize his help, but I don't know, there was something off about the way that he said it. Four people standing in my way, four people. I want him to leave this competition. Dave, he truly poses a threat to me winning. Dave had his suspicions too, thinking that Kevin wouldn't mind seeing him out of the competition. Despite the pain and pressure, he made the tough call to stick it out to cook another day. But only more trouble was on the horizon for Dave. 
He got stuck handling both the appetizer and dessert stations, and when he tried to check in with Tennille about any menu additions that might have cropped up, things took a nasty turn. Is there anything new on cold app? Salads or anything? What a fucking idiot. She really didn't go there, did she? I personally can't stand Tennille. I will never bring conflict onto the kitchen floor. Never. Meanwhile, Dave's poor hand kept getting worse. During the dinner service, Dave was holding down the meat station. He got his lamb sliced up, but when he went to lift the pan with his bad wrist, a massive jolt of pain shot through him. And it was so intense that he nearly collapsed right then and there. The light started going away, I got dark. Chef Ramsay noticed that something was off and followed him to the back store. Once there, he found Dave sweating bullets, looking dizzy and out of breath. Concerned, the famous chef sent him straight to the medic for a quick checkup. You're sweating, you're looking dizzy, and you're looking like you're out of breath. Come here, sir, can you just give him a once over? Thank you. A few minutes later, Dave was back in the kitchen. Despite the pain, he managed to get his lamb approved by Chef Ramsay. Talk about grit and determination. Later, when the chefs were lined up, Chef Ramsay didn't hold back his concern for Dave. He mentioned that he'd never seen a chef endure pain like that before, and he was worried that Dave might not be able to keep going in the competition. But Dave still wasn't ready to throw in the towel just yet. Oh, no, no, no. He assured Chef Ramsay of his intent to continue, pointing out that his right hand was still good to go. In a desperate attempt, begging Chef Ramsay not to boot him because of an injury, Dave made his case. One arm bandit is still here, and I'll see everybody at the Araxi when this is all said and done. But hey, Hell's Kitchen threw in a curveball that ended up putting a smile on his face. Your fiance McKay and your sister Allison. <laughs> and this further cemented Dave's resolution to win the whole damn thing. You don't realize how much you miss somebody until you get to see them again. No words can describe how I felt. And win it, he did. After being faced with threats to leave the competition as early as episode 3, Dave emerged as the undisputable winner of the season, literally winning Hell's Kitchen with one hand tied behind his back. I can't believe I won. It's a dream come true. And Chef Ramsay couldn't be happier. Dave has a very natural ability and a very sophisticated palate. He fought through excruciating pain and excelled and went on to win Hell's Kitchen. He's going to be an amazing asset to the Raxi restaurant and bar in Whistler. Winning Hell's Kitchen was a dream come true for him, but it wasn't a magical cure-all for his problems. After clinching the Season 6 victory with his culinary finesse and one-handed prowess, Dave was all set to jet off to Whistler, British Columbia. This was all to claim his head chef thrown at a Raxi restaurant and bar, accompanied by a cool $250,000 prize. But hold on, here comes a twist. Upon arrival, Dave found out that the gig wasn't exactly what he'd bargained for. Instead of the coveted head chef spot, he was offered a line cook position. Like, talk about false advertising, huh? So, after being faced with the mother of all insults, he packed his things and bid Adzir to Whistler, heading straight back to his hometown in Chester, New Jersey. But fear not, Dave didn't hang up his hat for good. Nope, he dusted himself off and dove right back into the kitchen game, landing a sweet gig as a baker at Mara's Cafe and Bakery in Denville, New Jersey. Now, if you're itching to stay up to date with the latest and greatest from our one-armed champion on social media, you might be in for a bit of a challenge. But hey, who needs Instagram fame when you're whipping up delicious treats, huh? I'm glad he's living his best life, even if that means I can't snoop around in his private business. Ah, well. Anyway, what are your thoughts on Dave's journey? Don't forget to let me know in the comments section down below. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to visit my social media pages, drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications if you haven't already. And if you thought this video was crazy, wait till you see my next video right here, since it's even better.